What's happening guys, Keith here with another Impact Wrestling Review. So today we're going to take a look at the November 29th edition of Impact, what I thought was overall a good show. Uh, they did some more building toward Homecoming with current matches set up. We have another match announced. And uh, like I said, overall it kept me entertained. I thought it was a pretty easy watch. Um, granted, I did watch it where I had the ability to fast forward, so that helps a little bit. Um, it, there is a lot of commercials during the show. Uh, but So we open the show with Rich Swan and Willie Mack versus the Lucha Brothers. Why? We don't know. The match was just kind of thrown together. I know they had made mention that this could have homecoming implications on it, which we later find out that it did. Um, but this match was pretty much, I, I guess, overall a spot fest. It was, you know, we had Rich Swan and Phoenix start out, and they were just trying to match each other, one-upping each other. Eventually, Willie Mack and Pentagon came in. Two of them taunted each other. Then we had a super kick party. Everybody got laid out. Uh, Mack hit a Hurricane Rana on Pentagon. Mack and Swan get a handful of offense in. Lucha Brothers get some on their own. So it was kind of back and forth, pretty split. Willie Mack hits a beautiful pounce on Pentagon, followed by a Tope Con Hilo to the outside. Swan follows it up with his Phoenix Splash, and then Phoenix hits his twisting corkscrew onto everyone on the outside. Uh, Phoenix hit a reverse Rana onto Willie Mack. They take Rich Swan, hit him with the package pile or the stomp package pile driver on the apron. Pentagon hits a double stomp on Willie Mack. They hit a double the double team flip where uh, I guess Phoenix is on Pentagon's shoulders. He kind of flips him down onto Mack, and that's how they win the match. Like I said, really more of a high flying match. Nothing really crazy. Um, LAX comes out obviously minus Conan. They congratulate the Lucha Brothers on their victory. LAX says they've beaten everybody thrown at them, and they're finally going to give the people what they want, and that is obviously a match with the Lucha Brothers. So they lay down the challenge for homecoming. Obviously, the Lucha Brothers accept, so we have a tag team title match set for homecoming. Um, I don't know if this match necessarily needed uh, the tag titles, because obviously... LAX are Conan's boys, and so are the Lucha Brothers. You could have just had a storyline there. Um, I don't like that they went with the quote-unquote dream match. At least when it was booked here, a little later on, we get a little more. That's intriguing. Um, they really haven't done too much with Pentagon post his feud with Sammy Callahan, and uh, Phoenix has kind of just been in the background. We saw him have... Two great matches, with one with Johnny Impact and the other with Brian Cage. But outside of that, we really haven't seen much from them. Um, we learn then that the qualifying matches for Ultimate X will take place next week, or they will start next week. Um, we did get one of those matches later on in the show. Then we take a look at the Brian Cage and his reasoning for choosing option C. Um, then we go backstage, and Conan is there, and he is furious with LAX making the announcement without telling him. He told he told them it wasn't time, and it isn't. Conan tells a story about Juventud Guerrera and Rey Mysterio. They wanted to have a dream match. I think it was like a they had first match Juventud hurt Mysterio, and the second match Rey hurt him, and then they were never friends again. So they had a whole big thing, and then. Conan says that they crossed the line. Pentagon, Pentagon and Phoenix want the titles, and they'll do whatever it takes to get them. Since Conan has business with both men, it puts him in an awkward situation. So it'll be interesting to see how they build this with Conan being in the middle. Um, but like I said, don't know if the tag titles were necessary for this match. Again, much like the OGs where the tag titles were just there for some unknown reason. Um but maybe this will lead to a split between Pentagon and Phoenix. We'll get that brother versus brother match. Probably not, but wishful thinking. Um, I think that should be somewhere they look further on down the line. Um, then we have the rematch from Final Hour, Jordan Grace versus Katarina. Um, I thought this match was booked well, definitely for a rematch. Um, but I think they would have been better off had the first match been more of a squash match rather than... Katarina getting a decent amount of offense in. I feel like that would have translated better into this match. Um, obviously, Jordan starts out strong. She got a great reaction from the crowd when she came out. 
Um, she hits a spine buster, goes for a bear hug to put Katarina away once again, like she did at final hour. However, Katarina is able to counter it, so obviously she did her homework. Uh, Katarina gets the upper hand. She's faring much better in this match than the last one. Katarina hits a jumping DDT off the top, near fall. Um, then Katarina comes off the ropes after her. Jordan hits a giant a pounce. And then Jordan goes to work and eventually puts Katarina away with the bear hug, and she taps out. So like I said, they booked the match pretty well. Um, I would have liked to have Jordan win much more convincing the first run, and then, you know, Katarina basically say, you got me, you got caught me off guard, you got lucky, and then you could have brought in the rematch. But it was fine the way it was. They booked it well. Um, but that was that. Then we go backstage, and KM is apologizing to Falaba about their missed opportunity at the tag titles, and then ultimately Scarlet. They realize they're still in Vegas, so they're going to hit the town. Then the black screen comes up, and it says, seven minutes later. Um, both men are crying, saying they lost everything. Scarlet interrupts and says, you guys used to be at the top of my list, but now you're at the bottom. There is a lot of competition, which obviously leaves them crying more. This is a good little segment. I really like what they're doing with Ba and KM. Glad they're getting them on the show each and every week. Um, definitely a missed opportunity with them challenging for the tag titles. Uh, like I said, LAX has kind of been in feuds where the tag titles weren't necessarily the focus. I think it would have been better. And me and Roe from the Impact Lounge spoke on this. It would have been better if they were utilized differently. But it is what it is. You just got to take it and uh, see what they do with it. Again, they should just really capitalize on KM and Fala Ba. They should be beating enhancement talent, getting put over. Um, they are crowd favorites, and people love them, so makes sense to do that. Then we have the GW on flashback. We see Ultimate X. I know Loki was there, Andrew Everett, I believe. Trevor Lee was there. I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention, to be completely honest. Um, then we go backstage, and referee Brandon Toll comes up to Tessa and wants to know what her problem is and why she keeps putting her hand on officials. Uh, he says that when you're in my ring, I'm the official. She says, yes, sir, and then rolls her eyes. So those are pretty good. I like that they're uh, doing something a little different, and it kind of adds to the whole Taya uh, situation, which we will see more of that later on. Uh, we have an interview with Tommy Dreamer. Mackenzie is interviewing him. Uh, he complains about Eli having entitlement, millennial nonsense. I just think it's weak writing when they go that route. If that's even writing, they could have said, here, Tommy, say whatever you want, um, which I guess that would make more sense. But I, I don't know. I, I just think it's lazy when they go that route. But he calls Eli a wannabe actor, says he's a ripoff of The Rock, that he failed on, this, on Stone Cold's Broken Ranch TV show. And uh, he lost the heavyweight title and settled for complacency. So it was overall a good uh, promo by Dreamer. But again, some of the content was a little lacking. I just think it's, you know, a cheap way out. Go that route. Uh, then we had Raylin versus Taya Valkyrie. Josh says that there is a Taya shirt coming very soon to Shop Impact. So that is good. Um, Taya got a really good reception from the crowd. Where a loca chance starting at the beginning of the match. Raylin hits a nice drop kick. Taya hits double knees in the corner. She gets a near fall. Uh, Raylin starts to taunt Taya. Taya kind of puts her in that Mexican surfboard position and uh, stomps her down. And then she makes her tap out. She had her in like a bow and arrow position, which they seemed to make it that this was going to be one of her new submission finishers. So after the match, Tessa comes down and attacks Taya from behind. Taya rolls out of the ring. So then she lays out the ref, who is obviously Brandon Toll again, and then she chokes him out. The rest of the referees come out, along with Scott Demore and Sanjay Dutt. Um, they're just kind of trying to yell at her, get her off, obviously not making any physical contact with her. Gail Kim comes out at this point, rips her off the referee. Huge pop for Gail. She looked fantastic. Taya hits Tessa with a spear. And Tessa's laid out on the ramp, you know, kind of like, what the hell? So I don't know. This is my overall thought. I think they're planting seeds to an eventual Gail Kim versus Tessa match. I I just think it makes sense. Uh, I, I, for one, would like to see it. I know Gail said she was done, but never say never in the wrestling business. 
if I was a betting man, I would say probably slam anniversary of this year. I think they're just going to plant the seed and then little by little build it up. I'm sure Tessa will uh, have something to say next week. But, you know, it added another element into the Taya match, uh, especially giving her enhancement talent to get some wins up against Tessa or, you know, when she goes against Tessa because her last few outings, I believe, were losses. Obviously won to Tessa at Bound for Glory and then... I guess technically she won by DQ when she had a rematch, but again, you got to build up the challenger to face the champ. Uh, so we go backstage, and Johnny is talking about his match with Cage at Homecoming. He is interrupted by Killer Cross. Killer Cross tells the cameras to get lost. He's got to talk to Johnny privately. So a cameraman walks away, obviously hiding behind a corner or something to that extent. So we still get a glimpse of what's going on. Uh, Cross says that Cage will do anything it takes to win. Johnny says he will do whatever it takes to retain the title. And Cross says, I, I think you have, you and I have very in different interpretations of do anything. Cross is trying to get Johnny to ask him to help him. But Johnny is like, well, what do you want from me? He seems all confused and frustrated and then he kind of got the hint and said no and just walks away. So this is far from over. I know Cross is going to play some sort of role in the World Championship match at homecoming. I wouldn't be surprised if um, this is made into a triple threat match down the road, depending on the outcome of the match. But Cross is definitely going to get involved one way or another, if or I should say if Johnny likes it or not. Um, then we have the debut of the Rascals. Uh, this was Desmond Xavier and Zachary Wentz. Trey Miguel was at ringside, so I'm wondering if that's how they're going to do it here. I know Xavier and Wentz were are tagged on the independents, and uh, Trey Miguel is more so a singles competitor, so if that's how they do it, that's fine. Uh, they were facing Chris Bay and Mike Seidel. Seidel is apparently Matt Seidel's brother. Uh, Chris Bay is a local wrestler, so he got a decent reaction there. Um, but the Rascals get, did get a good reaction making their debut. Um, it did take Impact long enough to bring in Wentz and Miguel and put them all together. I'm very happy about that. I've been pushing that for a while. I mean, this isn't the first time Zachary Wentz has been on Impact last year. Um, I think in OVE's debut match, he was actually one of the uh, jobbers that faced the two of them. And then obviously we saw them back in over the summer at the... Uh, August tapings, I believe, but uh, we see Wentz hit a beautiful springboard corkscrew crossbody. Bay ends up hitting a nice Hurricane Rana after that. Um, like I said, Bay got a good reaction. Uh, Rascals obviously working together really well. You can tell that they are a polished tag team. Uh, Xavier and Wentz hit stereo suicide dives, followed by a kick and then a knee, and then they hit the Hot Fire Flame, which is their finisher. Wentz goes for a standing moonsault, and then Dez pushes him toward the downed man, and he lands it, and that was that. I've seen them use this on the Independents. Very cool move, very innovative. Um, I like what they I saw, and it seemed like the crowd did as well. So um, I would assume... I mean, I know Xavier and Wentz had a fantastic match with... Uh, the Lucha Brothers at uh, Bola, I believe it was this year. So I hope we get that down the road at some point. Um, I think that would be something big to build to. Um, we go backstage, and Mackenzie is interviewing Kiara Hogan. Uh, Kiara says it seems like the dark... No, Mackenzie said that it seems like the darkness has consumed Allie. Kiara says Sue may think she has Allie, but she doesn't. She says Allie, or they promised each other they would have their backs... And she tells Allie, don't let the darkness consume you. You are stronger than this. It just seemed like it was really heartfelt from Kiera. She did a good job. Um, I think they were hyping the Dark Alley debuting next week. Um, I could see them having a match at Homecoming, Allie and Kiera. So we'll see. Um, that was it. All we saw from the two of them on this, or I should say from anybody involved in that storyline on this show. Uh, then we head to Maryland, where Eddie Edwards is in a mental institution. Alicia said she did it to save Eddie. He's, you know, if Moose called the cops and he tried to kill him or whatever that they were going for, he sa uh, she says he would have gone away for 20 to 25 years. Eddie is obviously 
heavily drugged and he's not responding. The doctor says that Eddie needs his rest and escorts Alicia out. We then see Moose come in and he sits down with Eddie. He has Eddie's new book in his hand. And Moose says that even he visited his enemy when he was in the hospital because he is the better man. He opens the book and asks Eddie about all the things that he has left out. Uh, he says the book is a fraud, and he said he's going to check on Alicia because she left upset, and uh, then he leaves. So this is obviously not done. We knew that. Uh, I would assume they're going to have a blow-off match at homecoming. It's going to need some sort of stipulation. I wouldn't mind seeing a steel cage match, to be honest. I think that that type of match would warrant this, um, but we'll see. It's, it's interesting the way they're going here, um, but yeah. Then we have uh, Mackenzie interviewing Eli Drake. Eli says maybe he should have apologized because he struck a nerve with Tommy Dreamer. He says Tommy has a soft ego, and tonight he is going to put him in a retirement home. Uh, then we have Matt Seidel and Ethan Page backstage. Seidel said he knew it wasn't going to be a straight path, but he has been stumbling along the way. Him and Ethan go back and forth a little bit, not really seeing eye to eye. So Ethan tells Matt to teach him the way. Seidel says next or uh, the X Division Championship match at Homecoming next week in the qualifiers. It's going to be me versus you. So that is our first match for the qualifying matches for the X Division Championship at Homecoming. That should be an interesting match. Uh, and if I would assume probably Seidel will get in, but. That makes sense to me, but who knows? We'll see. That is why we watch the show each week to see what happens. Uh, then we have the main event, which is Eli Drake versus Tommy Dreamer. Uh, Josh announces that they are going to Mexico in January for a set of tapings. Tommy gets some offense in early. He hits a cutter on Eli. Eli rolls out of the ring. He says, screw this. I'm done. Starts walking up the ramp. Referee's counting to 10. He gets counted out. All of a sudden, Josh... Here's something over his headset. He grabs a microphone and says, Impact officials have restarted the match, and it is now no disqualification. Obviously, this gets a big pop from the crowd. They fight up the ramp. Tommy heads to the back. He brings out some toys, trash can full of weapons. Uh, Dreamer gets the ring bell. Eli's laying on the apron, I think, at this point. He puts the ring bell on Eli's groin and then smacks it with the hammer. Then he takes a woman's cane out of the audience and tries to insert it into Eli, not orally. Um, Eli hits a suplex onto the ramp. Eli gets the upper hand. Dreamer is obviously looking winded at this point, and I think Callus made um, mention that obviously Tommy is much older and not the same man he was 20 years ago. So the longer the match goes, the more it will favor Eli. Um... Dreamer ends up getting some offense in. He brings a chair and a trash can into the ring. Eli hits a drop toe hold on Dreamer onto the chair. They go back and forth. Dreamer hits a DDT for a two count. Dreamer goes for the Death Valley driver. Eli gets out of it. He hits a low blow on Dreamer and then hits the dr gravy train, and Tommy Dreamer kicks out. They made a huge deal. It's the first time anybody's kicked out of the gravy train. Why it was Tommy Dreamer, that is beyond me. That's very strange of them to do that. Um, Eli puts a chair around Dreamer's head. Um, oh, wait, no. First, I think Dreamer had, or it was Eli, set up the trash can in the corner. So Dreamer went into the trash can. Then Eli puts the chair around Dreamer's head, hits the chair with an oar that was in Tommy's bag of tricks, and Eli gets the win. Uh, he's walking up the ramp, kissing the oar. He heads backstage, and we see uh, some balloons with a card on it. It says Eli. Eli opens it. There's a note. Eli reads it, and he's obviously confused and says, what? And then that's how we end the show. So I would assume Eli will have a match at homecoming, and this person who sent him the note is probably who his opponent is going to be. Um, but, yeah, we will see in the upcoming weeks. Still not sure if they are doing... The last two weeks of December as recap shows like they have done in the past. Um, so if not, I mean, then we have another four weeks. But if they do, we only have two weeks. Uh, it would be interesting, though, for them to do two weeks. And then all of a sudden you have two weeks off and then the pay-per-view starts. But I guess that kind of restarts everything with the pay-per-view. And then they're only going to do one night of taping after it. And then they're going to go to Mexico at the end or middle of January. 
So, like I said, overall, I thought the show was good. I thought it was a pretty easy watch, but nothing too, too crazy. Um, should be interesting to see how the viewership is after last week being up. Uh, I would assume probably next week we will get another match, and then we'll have those um, qualifying matches for Ultimate X. I believe they were hyping up for some reason Moose and Tessa versus Johnny Impact and Taya, which is really seems like a match just thrown together. No uh, real reason for that match to get made, but, yep, now I'm rambling on. So that is all I have for you guys today. Thanks for checking out my review. Let me know in the comments section below what you thought of this week's episode of Impact, along with my review. And I will see you guys possibly tomorrow with the review for Impact Wrestling Gold Rush tonight that streams live on Twitch. So thanks for checking out my video. And until next time, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks, guys. Bye. Did you like that video? If so, click here to check out more great content. Thank you for supporting the Clock Cleaners Podcast.